happy Halloween. Uh, Halloween to me always signals that it's a kid's time of year, that you're moving into uh, uh, you know, the trick-or-treating, which will come like an onslaught tomorrow. By the way, if you were like us, you were praying that the weather would be good. And it looks like the Lord has answered the prayer because the weather is going to be held off for one more day till Tuesday. And that's good because we uh, passed out 270 tracks last year to kids who we may not ever see. And um, we want to take advantage of that opportunity. And a big reason for that was because the weather was real nice last year. So uh, we want to take advantage of that this year. But I always kind of consider this a kid's time of year going from Halloween through Thanksgiving and on into Christmas. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, what do they call it? The great pumpkin Charlie Brown clip. Um, uh, Charles Schultz was a believer. Um, and as you know, the, the Linus uh, was worried about a great pumpkin spirit. And it turns out there is no such thing. Uh, I know that's a shocker to you all. But, um, but anyway, this idea of it's kid's time of year, I want to show you a video. It's a video I showed at Camp Iroquoina four or five years ago, but just to give you a framework of about little children. So hopefully this works. The oldest kid in the video, as I understand, is 11. Um, yeah, it's kids time of year. Uh, statistics say that 85% of people who come to know Christ as their savior will do so by the time they're age 11. Um, uh, it comes out of a few studies from the Barnard Research Group. Um, by the way, it's getting, the age is getting younger. Um, we kind of need to reach kids with the gospel before they get too far along. Things of the world, frankly, things of the education system that are uh, controverted against the scripture are trying to get to them. Uh, but the Lord loved little kids. Um, you go into antiquity, uh, I took a course called The Legend of King Arthur. Uh, I had to take it to get out of Notre Dame and, uh, and take an English credits and uh, decided to do that. And the professor said um, uh, that really you don't find in antiquity stories about children with one exception. The scripture has tons of stories about children. But really there's no, it's not valued in ancient history where little children, of course, you know the Lord loves little children. So just an encouragement as you have little kids coming tomorrow to your doors. Um, and we're going to talk about Halloween here in a second. And, uh, you know, Halloween is... Um, yeah, flip the slides here. Um, the gospel with children. Uh, we've got tracks. We've got a big campaign we're doing tomorrow. I think we've got a thousand tracks here. Uh, a couple are going to be passed out together. But um, thank you. That's good. Uh, I have a buddy of mine, uh, Chris. Uh, Saul Halloween is a two-way street. He would give every kid who came to his door a gospel tract. And then he'd go out with his own kids trick or treating, and then he'd give every one of them to attract. So he was getting doing both acts. Um, by the way, he would really see dress up as devil witches or things like that that are normally associated with evil. But he would let them dress up as cats or I don't know superheroes or what have you. Um, so Halloween is an opportunity, um, and we're going to try to avail ourselves of that tomorrow. I, I will say this though: there is. Uh, you know, just by way of, if you go to the next slide, um, it is, its origins are not good. Um, and frankly, my Irish ancestors are to blame for part of this. Um, Halloween's origins can be found in the ancient Celtic festival of, we would pronounce it Sam Hain, but it's actually pr pronounced Saw Wen in Gaelic. And it means end of summer. Basically, the Celts and their priests, which were the Druids, recognized that November 1st was the start of the new year. And they had this crazy, uh, um, you know, the, the idea that the harvest was coming in and now they were moving into the winter. And they had this idea that they would gather on the evening, October 31st, November 1st, and offer these sacrifices up to their pagan gods. Um, and they had this crazy notion. They were very given over to uh, occultic practices, things that the scripture would absolutely condemn. Uh, they were given over to divination, trying to contact the dead. Uh, they had this notion that ghosts and spirits uh, occupied uh, the world around them. By the way, that's completely condemned by Scripture. Uh, scripture teaches it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. When you see these programs that crop up that talk about haunted houses and this thing or that, um, if it's anything at all, it's a manifestation of fallen angels trying to deceive mankind. 
And um, so the Druids and the Celts fell for this idea that um, the spirits of the departed dead would come back and potentially haunt you. And they believed that uh, on November 1st, as this got darker, that there was something special about that day in their mind where the spirits of the departed dead, particularly from the last year, could come back and visit them. They would often leave uh, plates out for anybody who died in their family in the past year. Uh, for other spirits that they thought were wandering, they would leave out candies and treats. Uh, they wanted to keep away from bad spirits, so they'd carve a turnip and make a hideous face on it and put that in the front of their house. It's the source of the jack-o'-lantern. They didn't use pumpkins, they used turnips. So uh, I like turnips, by the way, or rutabaga, I think is what I like. But, um, uh, but a lot of the things you see in our culture go back to kind of pagan roots uh, with Halloween. Um, and uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, along about November 1st, November 2nd, as they moved into Ireland, they uh, created a holiday called All Saints Day around November 2nd. And the idea was to honor those who had died. And it was very much viewed with Ireland in mind. And they kind of coupled together All Saints Day and Halloween. And, and it made its way into much of the Western world through the influence in this mixture of what we call syncretization of pagan Celtic ritual with uh, with some of the practices of the church. And we have vestiges of that in our culture to this day. Now, would I send kids out trick-or-treating? Yeah, I would. But I would use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. And um, uh, But understand that, um, you know, this is a day where the world has not divorced the wickedness of the occult from this holiday. And it's why if you have any kind of TV channel, you know, it's just encumbered with wickedness in these programs. Um, but again, I think you welcome trick-or-treaters, but getting good candy, by the way, you're going to give them the gospel track. You want to give them good candy. And if you go trick-or-treating, you know, dress up in something nice and don't look like a witch or a devil. Um, there's no honor in that. Um, but there is such a thing as the unseen realm. Um, this is from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The presumption of Scripture, the clear teaching of Scripture is that there is a personal devil who exists. There is a being out there that exists who is the devil. Um, according to the Gospel Coalition, about 56% of Americans uh, believe there is uh, a devil, a real devil that's out there. By the way, we are quickly becoming a paganized nation. Barna says it's 57%. Gospel Coalition says it's 56%. Those surveys were taken two years ago. Um, you go back to 1992, 30 years ago, 83% of Americans believed in the devil. Uh, today we're at 56, 57, I'm sorry, 73% of Americans believed in a personal devil. Today we're at 56, 57%. That's a steep decline. And you know where the decline is occurring? Amongst the younger generations. Um, evangelical Christians, born-again Christians, we would consider ourselves born-again Christians. We're evangelical Christians. About 86% of us believe in the existence of a devil. Well, we should because the scripture teaches through and through, including passages like this, that there is a being who is the devil and he is a fallen angel. And we're going to spend the balance of our time today talking about the passages that tell us who he is and what he's all about. Um, and to be forewarned is to be equipped. Um, I had a professor out at Emmaus, um, and he was fond of saying that the great mistake of the 20th century was that we depersonalize the unseen spiritual realm. Um, and what we've done is we've misplaced a couple of letters. Uh, see, coming into the 20th century, um, people felt overwhelmingly in the Western world that there was a God and there was a devil. But we depersonalized that in the 20th century. It started in the late 1800s so that we added the letter O to the word God, and now he's just good, the forces of good in the world. And we've taken the word devil and we've removed the D, and now it's just evil. Uh, it's interesting if you read Brethren writers 150 years ago, they talk about this. 
130 years ago, 140 years, Phillips talks about this, that he believed that um, man's inhumanity to man would go through the roof because we were depersonalizing the unseen realm. And you all know your history enough to know that that's exactly what occurred in the 20th century. Um, as we depersonalize the unseen realm that is very rural, we've opened a kind of Pandora's box to man's inhumanity to man. Um, just in the next slide, um, and keep going. These are uh, writings from Moses and from Job and from Peter. Uh, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about the early events in the Garden of Eden. He says, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So early on, we see the serpent right there. He's around before humanity is. It's one of the terms for the devil. Job writes, uh, probably 2,000 years before Christ, uh, uh, several hundred years before the Pentateuch was written by Moses, he talks about a personal devil as well. There was a day when the sons of God, that's angels, that's referring to angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, one of the titles, one of the names of the devil, also came among them. And 2,000 years later, Peter, the apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just like Paul is also talking about the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So today we're going to look at two chat passages chiefly that give us insight into why the devil fell and who he is and what he's doing in the world today. And to set this up, we're going to go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 is one of the most fascinating prophecies that has a shift take within it. Ezekiel 28, uh, the prophet is writing right around the time that Babylon is getting ready to destroy Judah. He's writing about 600 years before Christ or so. And he talks about this character named the Prince of Tyre in the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 28. Um, He's a, a human prince who's a lousy fellow. He's bad to the Jews, and he's going to be judged uh, by God eventually. And partly Babylon is going to carry out that judgment. Uh, we know from history that his name is Idiobulus, and he's a pretty lousy prince over Tyre. And if you don't know where Tyre is, Tyre is in the country of Lebanon. Juts out into the sea. And uh, first 10 verses, you see this prophecy against this prince of Tyre. And then out of nowhere, there's a left turn. In verse 11, you have a switching of the prophecy being against the prince of Tyre to now talking about somebody who's called the king of Tyre. And as you go through the passage, you realize this is a very different individual. It's talking about the being that is animating the human prince of Tyre. And it becomes very clear that he is otherworldly. Ezekiel 28 verse 11 says this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Ezekiel, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This metaphor, this term that's called for the devil here, king of Tyre, um, you begin to get a sense that when Lucifer was created, the devil before he fell when he was created, it was said of him that he was a seal of perfection. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Before Lucifer fell, he was morally, intellectually, and visually beautiful. Um, he's called the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. A number of theologians have written over time that he may have been the most beautiful being that God ever created, visually. He's gorgeous. He's brilliant. He's smarter than any human that's ever lived apart from the Lord. He's brilliant. And um, he is a, uh, you just look at him in every way. He just, at the time before he fell, he is the seal of perfection, as the scripture says. Um, next slide. Verse 13, and this is how we know it's not talking about Idiobulus, the, the guy who's running Tyre, because Idiobulus was never in the Garden of Eden. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Uh, clearly a reference to a supernatural being. 
every precious stone that's referenced here. These are ornamental stones. They're often associated with the high priest or priestly garb. They give you a sense and a little inkling that Lucifer, before he fell, might have served in some kind of high priestly capacity for the other angels. Certainly his, orna his adornment would give you that indication and other titles that are used of his before he fell. Um, it says that the workmanship of his timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Um, the translators of the uh, New King James Bible said, these three words here, timbrels and pipes, are about the hardest words to translate in the Old Testament. Um, the, uh, from what we know, um, the, the King James calls it timbrels and pipes, or the New King James calls it timbrels and pipes. The King James Version calls it tabrets and pipes, as does the American Standard Version. NIV says settings and mountings. We're not quite sure what it was. Darby uh, uses the terms timbers and pipes. Jewish translations, um, Masoretic text and the like, uses a word that essentially means it's tambourines and sockets. The closest thing we can image to this, if you go to the next slide, is a pipe organ. That it's as if he was a pipe organ for the Lord. It's clearly a metaphor. In other words, he's so beautiful before he falls. He's so wondrous. It's almost like his very presence was a song of praise to God. This is a pipe organ in the U.S. Air Force Academy. It's the biggest pipe organ in the world. Uh, it's 99 feet high. In other words, 10 stories high. It possesses over 4,000 pipes. Um, and the idea that the Air Force had when they built this pipe organ was to create one of pomp and circumstance to celebrate um, soldiers returning from the field. Uh, if you ever go to a military parade, I had the privilege of being down on 8th and I uh, down in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, during the Gulf War. I'm sorry, not during the Gulf War, during the, the uh, Iraq War. And I uh, got to see the Marine Corps uh, drill team. If you've if you ever want to see a drill team, go see the Marine Corps drill team. It's the most impressive. I've seen the British do their drills. They've got nothing on us. The Marine Corps, 8th and I, it's at 8th Avenue and I Street. When they do their presentation, it is the most impressive. They will flip rifles to each other, not even look at each other and catch them like this. And it's the most impressive thing. Um, I dare say the Marine Corps, 8th and I unit has nothing on the devil has nothing on his on the forces before they fell they were a glorious depiction of god's creativity and such was lucifer before he fell it's as if his very existence was a song of praise to god and yet look at this the scripture says the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes whatever that is was prepared for you on the day you were created here is a sharp contrast between biblical Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, and Eastern religions. Eastern religions will often imply or teach this idea of the eternal duality of good and evil. That's not what the Bible teaches. The devil was created. He was created perfect. He was created absolutely perfect, but he's still a created being. The devil is not everywhere present. Only God is everywhere present. Now, he has lots of fallen angels, and it may appear like they're everywhere, but they're not. They don't know everything. They know a lot more than we do, but they don't know everything. The only one who knows everything is God himself. He's a limited being just like us. The devil can't read your mind. He can put thoughts into it, but he can't read it. He doesn't know everything. Only God does. He's a created being just like we are. But just like we are, he also was given something right from the get-go that was a critical necessity to his being a personal being, and that is freedom of choice. God didn't want a bunch of automatons. He gave him freedom of choice, and I'll explain why he did that in a second. Next slide. We know this about Lucifer. He was the anointed cherub who covers God says in reference to him, I established you, you were on the holy mountain of God, you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Lucifer was a cherubim. Um, he served in a kind of high priestly role of one sort or another for other angels. The fact that he's called the anointed cherub has given theologians a reason to believe that he may have been if not one of the highest ranked angels, the highest ranked angel. He's certainly as high as any other angel. 
The reason why I think he might have been the highest ranked angel is because Michael in the book of Jude, who is a top dog angel, an archangel in his own right. In fact, God is going to give Michael command of all his armies during the tribulation in a fight against the devil. So I doubt there's anybody over than him. But even Michael in the book of Jude is respectful to the devil when they're arguing about the body of Moses. And if you're saying, what in the world is he talking about? Read Jude. It is fascinating. But even then you get the sense that Michael, because angels are so given over to authority and order, and even out of respect for what the devil once was, does not bring a railing accusation against the devil, even though he could, out of respect. So you get the sense that a Lucifer before he fell was a very high angel. By the way, how many wings do cherubim have? They have four. Seraphim have six. But both of them have a set of wings that's dedicated to doing what? Covering their own glory. So think about this. Lucifer, this gorgeous being, yet in the presence of God, he's supposed to cover himself. Not because of nakedness or shame or anything like that. He's supposed to cover himself because his glory is supposed to dissipate with the backdrop in comparison to the great glory of God. By the way, sisters, do you see that angels themselves are concerned with covering themselves in front of God? They cover themselves so as to veil their own glory so that God's glory would stand out. You get to carry that here in the human race the way we men don't. When you cover your head, you're veiling what is considered to be the most beautiful part of humanity. You know, perfect Garden of Eden, perfect man, right? And there's still something missing. The gal. She's the crowning jewel of creation in so many ways. And, and because of that, because she's the, and every guy knows that the girls are better looking than the guys are. Just look at me, right? Um, the, uh, the most beautiful part of humanity is the girl. And because she is the most beautiful part of humanity, her head is to be covered so that God's glory alone shines forth in the meeting of the church. Why does a man have his head uncovered? Well, because we're ugly to look at anyway. No. Because our head, in a way, is a depiction of God's glory. It's a reflection of God's glory. But a girl's head is a reflection of humanity's glory, and also her own glory. I'm not lost on any of the sisters in the room, let alone the fellas, that this teaching is waning in the church today. It's not going to wane here, because we see it as a clear teaching of Scripture to show our importance and the wonderful place we have before the Lord. And even Lucifer and the other angels cover their glory in God's presence. Um, cherubim are uniquely associated with scripture with, uh, in Scripture with protecting the way of access to God. You see their imagery all over the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant and the veil that was uh, the, separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. By the way, it uh, gives tremendous significance that that veil is torn in two when Christ died. Um, anyway, Angels have a way of approach to God that is different than our way of approach to God. But we'll come back to this too, uh, um, in one sense anyway. So it says that he established him on the holy mountain of God. Um, the holy mountain of God, this is the next slide. This is a picture of the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. Now that is a beautiful mountain range. Isn't that gorgeous? Let's go see that. Um, I skied in that area. It is just um, as beautiful a spot as there as there is. There may be as beautiful spots, but nothing more beautiful than the Grand Tetons. The Scripture uses this idea of the mountain of God. It's associated in the Scripture with God's kingdom. Before humanity was created, it's as if Lucifer and the angels are debriefed and are told about the coming of humanity. And in some way, it appears that Lucifer had some responsibility, this is before we were created, with this economy that God was going to bring about of a human kingdom. And he was given this responsibility associated with the mountain of God. It also says in the scripture that he moved back and forth um, among the fiery stones. We just read that, that he moved back and forth among the fiery stones. We know that fiery stones in scripture are a depiction of God's righteousness. In some way, he has a caregiving responsibility, a carekeeping responsibility in, uh, related to God's righteousness, um, which I think is profound. Uh, going to the next slide. So I think we've hammered home the point that this being was absolutely perfect. 
And Ezekiel 28, 15 is the most tantalizing verse in a lot of ways in Scripture, because it says you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. What brought about that iniquity? So the rest of the world's kind of shy from explaining how wickedness and evil came into the world. How did death come into the world? Not the Bible. The Bible's going to tell you exactly that it's sourced with this being who fell. It's sourced with this being who fell, and it started with iniquity being found in him. You say, well, I want to know more. Where did that come from? How did this happen with this absolutely perfect being? Well, the wonderful thing about Scripture is a question that's asked in one place is answered in another. And for that, we go to the book of Isaiah. And this is the lie that Isaiah deceived, I'm sorry, Isaiah, poor Isaiah, Satan deceived himself with. This is from Isaiah 14. Uh, go to the next slide. Again, a similar prophecy, a similar discussion. On Isaiah, you have this benediction against the king of Babylon. Just like in Ezekiel 28, it was a prophecy against the prince of Tyre. In Isaiah 14, it's a prophecy, a benediction against the king of Babylon. And yet, even in this, you see a switch where at one point it's talking about the king of Babylon, and then it switches to the force, the animating unseen spiritual realm that's behind the king of Babylon. And just in case there's any doubts, by the time you're down at verse 12 of Isaiah 14, it starts speaking overtly about Lucifer. So Isaiah 14, verse 12 says this, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and this is the iniquity that was found in Lucifer. It's what's called the great I will statements of the devil. The five I will statements of the devil in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. I will ascend to heaven. I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that the Lord says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Lucifer's name means light bearer. It also means son of the morning star, son of the morning, dawn of the morning. It means light bearer. It gives you a sense of what he initially was. Reflection of God's glory, a reflection of God's light, an advocate uh, for God, as it were, in a sense. Uh, this is all before the fall. But at a certain point, he was confronted with a challenge. Was he going to trust God or not? Was he going to trust God or not? See, remember what I said before about there's only one being who's omnipresent. There's only one being who's omniscient. There's only one being who can do it anything save for sin uh, is all powerful and that's god the bible teaches that god's name is i am who am the bible teaches that he is a god who's from everlasting to everlasting in other words he is the only being who has always existed and will always exist you'll always exist but you haven't always existed he has always existed and will always exist is there any way possible for lucifer to verify those things is there any possible for, for you to verify those things? Is there any way for you to possibly verify that God has always existed? Now, we know God has always existed, but there are things you have to take by faith. You have to take by faith that God is everywhere. You know why I know you have to take that by faith? Because you're not. You can't fly all the way to the ends of the universe and still be here at the same time. You're a localized presence, just like these angels are. You just trust it. He is. See, what happened in the Garden of Eden, in a sense, God was forcing the issue right off the bat with Adam and Eve. Are you going to trust me or not? When I tell you that I am all these things, and I've always existed, are you going to believe it or not? When I tell you that I'm the only one who is these things, are you going to believe it or not? Lucifer, is he's got full revelation of God like no one. And yet he too has to come to the choice where is he going to trust God or not? Is he going to believe that God is the only one who has always been all these things? Or did God somehow become these things? And he starts to deceive himself that somehow God became these things. You know how I know that? Look at these statements. I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Don't lose sight of the language there. He's not saying I am. He's saying one day I'll be. One day I'll be like this. I think that's what he was. I want that for myself. What does it mean when he says, I will ascend into heaven? This is an act of will for Satan. Satan has got a will, and he desires equal recognition with God. He doesn't desire to be greater than God, because he knows that's not possible. But he wants to be equal with God. He says, I'll be like the Most High. He never says, I'll be greater than the Most High. He says, I'll be like the Most High. Um, when he says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, the stars of God in Scripture is clearly a reference to what? Angels. Job 38. Stars of God are called angels. Uh, you see that in Job. Um, Satan had great authority and administrative power. I just told you that he was probably the highest ranked angel or one of the highest ranked angels. Why does he say here, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God? Isn't he already their boss? Something very different. It's one thing to have delegated authority. And it's another thing to have absolute authority because of who you are. You know, I'm a, I am the boss of uh, five organizations right now. But you know what? Any one of my boards could immediately remove me. <laughs> I answer to them, even though all those staffs report into me. Um, he wants his own authority. He wants to be above the angels on his own. He says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Again, this idea of the mountain seems to be an allusion to the messianic kingdom. This mountain is referred to in Psalm 48, Isaiah 2. He had some understanding that there was this coming human kingdom. It may have created a kind of jealousy in him. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Um, by the way, we know that Satan has been about the task of building his own dominion of darkness, his own false kingdom. How do we know that? Because the scripture says that in Colossians 1.13. And Christ thwarted Satan's efforts and is thwarting Satan's efforts at this competing kingdom. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. There are 130 references to clouds in scripture. A hundred of them pertain to God's glory. Satan wanted to share in God's glory. And then finally, he says, I will be like the Most High God. So here's a thought for you. Um, I, I know I've shared this story here before, but it's been about six years from what I can tell. Um, when I was, uh, I was skiing out near the Tetons, uh, Grand Tetons, those mountains I showed you before, and near there is a Bible college called Jackson Hole Bible College. Um, it's not an assembly school, but it's a decent a uh, very decent Bible college. doesn't have the accreditation that Emmaus has, but it's a good school. And at the time, uh, Dave Reed, who is known to some of us, was teaching out there. And he asked me to come along, and he, I, he was my mentor, and I was kind of like a protege to him. And he said, I want you to take one of the lectures. And uh, so I go out there, and I did one of the lectures with these kids, and it was fun to talk to them, and it was snowing outside, and I was getting ready to go skiing. It was the middle of January, very cold, about 20 below or something like that. Uh, but I was ready to go skiing because Jackson Hole's got these steep double diamonds, and if you know what skiing is and you like skiing, you want to do that stuff and, and also break your ankle. But um, after I'm done preaching, teaching the kids, it's time to go have lunch with the president of Jackson Hole Bible College, a guy named Don Landis and Dave Reed. And uh, so I thought this is going to be great. I'm going to get to sit and listen in on this conversation between Don Lannis and uh, Dave Reed. Dave Reed's a brilliant Bible teacher you'll ever come across. He's gone home to glory now. But um, all of a sudden it dawned to me who Don Landis was. Have you ever heard of the name of Don Landis? Don Landis is the head of Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham reports to him. He's the chairman of the board. Not the Don Landis from the Brethren Circles. This is Don Landis from the Baptist Circles. He's the head of Answers in Genesis. He has started a whole field of cultural anthropology that studies ancient cultures from the standpoint of the book of Genesis. The guy's brilliant. He's a celebrated lecturer. So I'm sitting there thinking, this is one of those times when you're around heavy hitters, you just be quiet and listen. And it was a guy who was on Don Landis' staff, and he and I are looking at each other like, we're going to be quiet this entire lunch and just listen to these guys. And so these guys start to talk about Isaiah 14. And they, as they're exegeting Isaiah 14 over a tuna fish sandwich or whatever it was we were eating, 
Don Landis says this to Dave Reed. I think this verse, I will be like the most high, is the birth of evolution. See, Satan convinced himself that he could evolve and become something better than what he was. He deceived himself. God wasn't always this way. He became this way. And Satan bought into a lie. I too can become something more substantively than what I am. And you know how I know that's true? So Reed says, I know how you know that's true. Because of Genesis 3. Because that's exactly the religion he sells Eve on. Eve, you could be so much more. You could be like God. So that's where the theory of evolution was birthed. It didn't start with Darwin 1840s. It started all the way back in eternity past. Not eternity past, because it's at a moment in time when this iniquity was found in Satan. Um, and then he started to sell that religion. And you know, it's not only that he sold that religion to Eve, he started to sell it to other angels. So if you look, next passage, the scripture says in Isaiah, going back to Ezekiel, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, a covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. What does it mean by the abundance of your trading? We know from the book of Revelation that as many as a third of the angels rebelled with Lucifer against God. So what did he do? What does it mean, abundance of trading? I doubt there's U.S. dollars being exchanged for Japanese yen in the, turn, you know, in the angel economy of things. What is he trading to get people or angels to go along with him? He trades with them the same thing he was trading with Eve. You can become something better than yourself. So look at the next uh, slide here. Um, a few of you serve in a police force at different points in your life or, or were uh, in the military, at least a, a few of you were. Um, these are ranks. Uh, I was with uh, 4th Marine Expeditionary Force uh, uh, as an advisor when I was working for Morgan Stanley back in 2006, and I had to learn the Marine Corps ranks uh, because I was with them for a few weeks. And um, uh, they're the ranks of the uh, non-commissioned officers and then of the, uh, of the officer staff. Do you know that angels have ranks too? Go to the next slide. We know this because of several passages in Scripture. Uh, we know from Ephesians 1, by the way, it should say Colossians 1, 16, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, and Ephesians 6, 12. So that 6, 12 pertains to Ephesians. That was my bad. I just caught it two seconds after I came up here. Um, but these are the ranks that we know of in Scripture. The top are the archangels, then there's thrones below them, then there seem to be senior dominions below them, principalities, powers, rulers, Commanders of spiritual hosts, mites, and then junior dominions. Uh, at least nine ranks that we know of in Scripture. They probably have far more. By the way, how many angels do we think there are? There are probably more angels than there are humans by a multiple. There's one occasion in the book of uh, Daniel where it says a, a company of angels came together. And if you look at their numbers, it's a hundred million. One company of angels coming together. Who knows how many there are? And they're um, amazing beings. So you know what I think Satan does? He goes to the rulers. He says, how would you like to be a power? Want to get a higher rank? Come follow me. He starts to sell them. Instead of accepting what God has made them, you know, he starts to sell them on the idea that you can become something more. And by the way, you don't want to become something more. Think about this. The scripture says we're made a little lower than the angels. We're substantively less than them. We're not as powerful as them. We're not as smart as them. We're not as pretty as them. Uh, some of you are less pretty than others. Um, and yet, God chose to become one of us. He didn't choose to become one of them. You want to accept what God has made you. Anyway, um, so let's keep going. Next slide. It says you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Um, make no mistake about it. Satan is violent, and the titles given for him in Scripture are absolutely terrifying. Um, I think one of the most profound deceptions that Satan has done with the world is he has convinced people, well, if there is a good God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? They ask this question, forgetting this whole thing of the freedom of mankind in the rebellion against God, and all of the suffering that's in the world is as a result of two things. 
It's a result of an evil demonic force that is urging humanity on to wickedness. But even more so than that, much more so than that, it's our own fault. Humanity sinned against God, and we brought death and sin and disease and everything that's in this world that's bad, we brought upon ourselves. Not individually, though individually every one of us has sinned, but collectively as a race, we have killed this universe. We're killing this universe because we've sinned. And the natural consequence of rejecting the author of life is what? Death. Uh, the titles of the devil are terrifying. He's called the accuser of the brethren in Revelation. He's called the adversary in the roaring lion in 1 Peter. He's called the ruler of demons or Beelzebub in Luke 11. Um, he's called Belial in 2 Corinthians 6, which means arrogant one or without a master or the lawless one. He's called the one who destroys everything. Uh, he's called the dragon, the great dragon, the fiery red dragon, the serpent of old, uh, the one who deceives the world in Revelation 12. He's called the enemy and the wicked one in Matthew 13. He's called a murderer, a liar, and a father of lies in John 8. And he's called the God of this age by Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. Power of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience in Ephesians 2. He's called the tempter and the thief. Um, next slide. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before the kings that they might gaze at you. If sin did this to him, how much more circumspect do we need to be about our lives and also aware and appreciative for how Jesus Christ has saved us? Sin is not a being. It's a state of existence and rebellion against God. Sin is what you do. It's what you think. It's not a being. It's what you do when you reject God as Lord. When you reject the supremacy of God in your life, that's sin. When Satan did that, he died spiritually. And we're all dead spiritually apart from Christ. Um, next slide. Ezekiel 28, verse 18, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst, it devoured you, and it turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you, you became a horror and shall be no more forever. This obviously is ultimately fulfilled in the future, about as being uh, cast down in front of the sight of all the peoples, but sin devoured him. Now, let me not leave you in the dark place with my dark slides. Next slide. Christ himself, likewise, shared in the same, that is, took on human flesh, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Lord Jesus Christ chose not to save the angels. You know, it's interesting. Why, why don't the angels get a second chance? Well, I think they're considered a host as opposed to a race. You know what I mean by that? They're all created at the same time. They don't have mommies and daddies. They're all created at the same time. They didn't get sin natures because somebody else sinned, because their parents sinned. They didn't get them. They had a choice to either believe God or not believe God. When they rebelled against God, they weren't encumbered by the sin nature like we are. They rebelled against God, but that's it. Hebrews 2.16 makes it very clear there is no aid for fallen angels. There's no availability for repentance for them. God doesn't owe it to them. He doesn't owe it to us either. But in God's kindness, kindness, grace, and mercy, he's chosen to provide us who are just as guilty as those fallen angels. You never had to commit one sin that you've committed. You never had to do it. Just as guilty. But God in his kindness for us as you read Romans, it seems to have to do with us being a race. Um, that God the Son was able to represent the human race the way Adam did in the garden. He was able to represent us and provide us with a way to be saved. This is profound, heavy theology here. And uh, Lord Jesus Christ, when he took on the form of humanity, he becomes related to us. He can now represent us. He lives under the same trials, rules, laws, he never sins. He lives a perfect life. He's able to pay the eternal price that our sins merit because he's fully God and because he's fully man. He overcame everything. When he goes to the cross, 
He is defeating sin, death, and the devil. He defeats it all in one fell swoop. And that's what's available to us as believers. We have the one, the scripture says, as soon as you put your trust in Christ, that his spirit, that he himself takes up residency in your heart. And you have this newness of life. Um, and you are made this new thing. And we have this new standing before God. Uh, what a wondrous thing that the Lord Jesus Christ has done in overcoming the sin through his death. So let me leave you with this. Um, go to the next slide. The scripture says to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are wiles of the devil? They're schemes, they're actions or beliefs that are designed to deceive or trick you. There are things that entice you to fall in your walk. So quickly, here's a few practical ways to stand against the wiles of the devil. Next slide. You want to build walls. You want to guard access points. Remember Nehemiah? He built the walls of Jerusalem. Why was he doing that? Because he was trying to keep bad things out. He wasn't trying to keep those evil influences out of Jerusalem. You want to build walls in your life. You want to develop habits that safeguard your life. You want to put walls in your life, either by habit or by thought, that protect you. Lyman Gordon, one of the elders here, used to say, don't be where you're not supposed to be. Put walls in your life. Don't put yourself in a place where you shouldn't be. You want to guard access points. Uh, once Nehemiah built the walls, he put guards around those access points so that uh, until the gates could be hung. An access point is any area of weakness that you have. So if you have an area of weakness in your life, put access, put guards around those areas of weakness. Access points can be the things you do, can be the things that you don't do that you should do. Um, maybe you shouldn't look at certain things or listen to certain things. By the way, you know what has destroyed more assemblies? This is inside baseball stuff here. Um, we're uh, uh, tracking closely with what's going on in one of the assemblies, um, uh, another state. Um, gossip and personality conflicts um, destroy meetings. Um, if people are not given over to dying to self in Christ, there's a verse in Titus 2 that says um, it condemns people in the assembly for engaging in gossip uh, or slander, speaking ill of someone. You know that the word that's used for slander or gossip is uh, in Greek is the term diablo. Now, isn't diablo a word for uh, devil. devil in Spanish? Yes. I find that interesting. It's almost like the root of slander and gossip comes from an unseen realm that we give ourselves over to. Anyway, you want to build walls or guard access points in your life. Here's a second bit of advice. Another way to stand against the wiles of the devil. Beware of enemy feints. These are tactics aimed at deception and false intelligence. Um, there's lots of false ideas out there. Do you realize how many battles have been won and lost because of false intelligence or not reading things the right way? You know, uh, we were the largest employer in the Trade Center in 9-11, Morgan Stanley was. And uh, if you ever read the reports about how much intelligence was out there letting us know this attack was coming, it'll frustrate you to no end. Failing to read the false information that is out there uh, or the information that's out there about wickedness. There's a lot of false information in the world right now. Uh, frankly, kids get exposed to it far more than we do. They're getting shoved stuff down their throat that's just false teaching, false thoughts, false ideas. Um, you need to be in the scripture and be on guard against such things. Um, anyway, next uh, slide. Recognize enemies in the midst. Be on the lookout for wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, the fact is, is that there are, are uh, plenty of ideas out there that are presenting themselves as truth or as being from God. Um, I think it's profound that... <clears throat> excuse me, that the big push that's going on around now with the gender issues and the LGBTQ issues, that they've grabbed hold of some legitimate concerns that were done in the 60s with the civil rights movement, and they've garnished them themselves in those same garb. And uh, they've deceived a lot of folks uh, into thinking that this is a just and way to conduct ourselves as a society. You can uh, be against... Uh, abusing people because they don't uh, have the same worldview as you are, but it doesn't mean we have to accept what they're doing is right. And um, there's more we could say about that, but I'm so over time. I'll just finish with these. Um, next slide is stay away from ambushes. 
Um, there are certain traps and ambushes that are designed to grab you. Um, the Bible says to stay away from the occult. Um, and yet some of you will fall for the psychic nonsense, the tarot cards, and the astrology. It'll pull you right in. Uh, the Bible says to stay away from sex outside of marriage. Um, yet the world tells you otherwise. Um, thank you. Um, the younger generation is, uh, when we start off talking about kids, the younger generation right now is very much in the crosshairs of the enemy like we've never seen before. Um, so parents and, and guardians, um, you've really got to equip your kids to identify ambushes that are out there um, waiting for them. Know the uniform is the next one. Um, you want to get godly friends and be accountable to them and frankly get rid of others. Uh, far, often, far more often than not, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, you want to be a witness to the world on the Lord's terms, not the world's terms. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a young person in your life, um, I would scrutinize the daylights out of their friends. You, know, you got little kids, right? So the two, they don't really have friends yet, but they're maybe they do, but they're, and it's not like they're talking about theology, right? But um, there's a point when they will be. Um, you want to really siphon off the friends that aren't good influences on them. And by the way, that applies to you too. Get rid of the friend. That sounds terrible. Get rid of the influences that are bad in your life. Just get rid of them. Um, you know when somebody's influencing you towards a certain direction versus you influencing them towards a certain direction. When they start to influence you towards a certain direction, get rid of them. I thought you'd hear that from a pulpit, but I think it absolutely is profound scripture that you get rid of those bad influences in your life. So I call this know the uniform. Be around the saints. Next one. Know your orders inside and out. I'll finish this with this. The best way to defend yourself, the best way to identify a counterfeit and to know what bad ideas are out there is to know your orders inside and out. What's your order manual? Right. This is your orders. This tells you how to navigate this world. So we're 10 minutes past. Um, isn't it wonderful we have a savior who is meet the dragon. Just waiting for him to occupy and in your life, he's already won the victory in your life. There's no reason you have to be uh, defeated by the devil in your life. Um, and we all know there's a far more worse adversary than the devil in our lives, right? Do you know what that is? What's the worst adversary that Gabriel faces? It's his flesh. It's my flesh. Scripture spends far more time talking about your flesh than it does talking about the devil. So understand where this is and things. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer and have a Good time sharing the gospel with little kids tomorrow if you get the chance. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that there's going to be a bunch of kids coming to the doors of this chapel tomorrow. We thank you. Uh, a number of us were talking earlier in the week. It looks like it's going to rain all day Monday. And now we look at the weather forecast, and you and your grace and kindness in response to our prayers have said not so in Yonkers. Uh, so we're grateful to you for that, Father. Last year we had 270 kids come by because of the way it was organized and, and uh, because we had people there. We just pray, Father, that number would be much higher this year. We have prepared accordingly with hundreds and hundreds of tracks, Father. We've got the volunteers lined up. Just pray, Father, uh, for the outreach that's going on here. And even for us at our houses as we give away tracks, whether they're Halloween-themed or not, little kids will read something that's different than the candy they're getting. And just pray, Father, that we might see little kids come to know Christ as their Savior. And again, Father, we're grateful to you that your Son has overcome sin, death, and the devil. No doubt, Father, there are angels in this room right now. And uh, the good ones marvel at the grace and the mercy that you have towards us. And so too do we. Christ, let me pray. Amen.